Well, believe it or not, this is the last talk that we're doing on the 50 characteristics, and I should just give you a bit of a background and a heads up around this. When I started in the addiction treatment world in 2004, at that point in time, there was one book by a lady named Janet Wojtitz who talked about the characteristics of children who grew up in alcoholic homes, and she put 13 different characteristics. And that was really the introduction to me to begin looking for characteristics that a child has um, who grows up in an al alcoholic or an addicted home. And then as the whole world of complex trauma became, became more and more understood, I began looking for common characteristics that people with childhood trauma have. And so I kept a list that I gradually added to as I taught workshops and counseled and dealt with clients and got up to what became the 50 characteristics of complex trauma. But what you don't realize is that I've been adding to that list. And so though we've advertised this as 50 characteristics, there's actually now 60 characteristics. So that's what I want to do in this final talk is do the final 13 characteristics of complex trauma. So the very first one in this set is almost everybody with complex trauma struggles with depression. There are two types of depression. There's one where there's a chemical imbalance in the brain. A child can be born that way, it be a genetic thing. And that person usually needs medication to help the brain get the right chemical balance and deal with their depression. But complex trauma adds another type of depression. And that is from a bunch of different aspects of complex trauma. First of all, it's from a child that grows up in just very negative situations. Life sucks. There's a lot of things that are happening where they're getting hurt, that are being frustrating, discouraging, feeling like failure. And so their whole life has quite an imbalance of negative greater than positive experiences. And so that just has that circumstantial type of depression that just feels very negative, very depressing. With that, there's also the shame element. So when you grow up in complex trauma, you grow up feeling that you're neglected or abused or abandoned because it's your fault. And so then you don't like yourself because you think you're not good enough. There's something wrong with you. And so when you live every day with that feeling of not being good enough, that's very depressing. And then beyond that, there's all kinds of negative, powerful emotions like anger and fear that you're trying to keep bottled up and stuffed down so that they don't come out. And it takes a lot of emotional energy to bottle all of that stuff up and keep it stuffed down. And that drains your emotional gas tank and that can lead to depression. And then there's part of the shame is you turn your anger on yourself and you hate yourself and you beat yourself up and, and that becomes something that feeds depression as well. And so I would say that over 90% of people with complex trauma end up with a certain amount of depression. And if you take that further, most people with on the more severe end of the complex trauma spectrum have struggled with suicidal thoughts. The brain cannot tolerate pain. It is always looking for a solution. And in most families that are healthy, when there's pain, that pain can be resolved so that the person can re return to a place of joy. In complex trauma, the brain is looking for a way to resolve all this pain, but isn't finding one. And so the option that becomes more and more likely to them or viable to them is to end it all. And so suicide can end up in the, in the thinking of those who struggle with complex trauma. So depression is a very, very common thing within complex trauma. The next is boundary issues. Now, when I teach boundaries, what, what I'm talking about to people are boundaries are the rules, the principles, the guidelines that we live by that keep us safe and that keep us healthy. So they're like going down a mountain road and there's guardrails on each side 
that as long as you stay within the guardrails, you're safe. As soon as you go outside of those guardrails and do unhealthy, then there's going to be very painful negative consequences. And so boundaries are designed as good things to protect us and show us how to be a healthy person. Take that a little bit further. What you need with boundaries is internal boundaries, so rules you choose to live by that affect how you're going to deal with your physical world, your body, sleeping, eating, exercise, your recovery world, meetings you're going to go to, going through the steps, people you're going to avoid, places you're going to avoid. All of those are rules that keep you healthy. And then what you have to do within your emotional world and spiritual world to keep healthy. And so you make rules for yourself and then you set up a routine and you discipline yourself to follow those routines. Those are internal boundaries. There's also external boundaries, which are two parts to that. The first is the rules that you're going to live by within relationships. So you might say, I'm not going to let somebody disrespect me. I'm not going to let somebody lie to me and stay in a relationship with them. If they disrespect me or lie to me, there's a consequence and I'm going to either pull away from that relationship or not let them in my life as much. And then the second part of boundaries is that how close do I let people get to me? How much of my time do I allow them to take? How much do I allow them to text me and phone me when they're struggling and have a problem? So I set boundaries that control how close I let people get into my life. Now the problem with complex trauma is it takes the good system of good healthy rules, boundaries, and it makes it very confusing. And a lot of the boundaries that kids grew up with weren't for their best, weren't to keep them safe or healthy. They were for what made their authority figures comfortable. And so there's a lot of distortions and misteaching that they feel around the subject of boundaries. And that makes it very difficult for them going into adult life to have healthy rules for themselves, for their relationships, and for how close they let others in. So what happens in a complex trauma home is a whole bunch of different possible things that mess up an understanding of healthy boundaries. So the first one would be in the area of some complex trauma homes have very, very strict boundaries. Others have no boundaries at all. So some, there's a, a thousand different rules about every little thing. Other is do whatever you want. Neither are healthy. And then some in complex trauma homes are inconsistent boundaries or the inconsistent of enforcement of boundaries. So some days dad makes a rule, the next day he doesn't follow that rule. Some days he, he quickly punishes you if you break a rule. Other days if you break that same rule, he lets you away with it. And so boundaries are never consistent. They're never consistently enforced. The consequences aren't consistent. And that can really mess up a person. And then there's a double standard often. So dad was allowed to be angry, but nobody else was. Dad was allowed to lash out at people or be lazy, but nobody else was. A double standard. And that makes you begin to realize that this isn't what's about best for me. This is all about what's best for them. And so you are taught to adapt your life, to give up your needs in order to accommodate their boundaries, which are all very self-serving. Many children aren't able to set boundaries with their parents. So their parents can just barge into their room, go through their drawers, read their journal, their diary, and if they say no to their parents and request some space, they get punished for that. So there's certain people in their thinking that you can never say no to. And if you do, you're going to pay for doing that. And so for a lot of children in complex trauma with parents that they couldn't say no to, the only way they learned how to set a boundary was not through verbalizing it. It was through either isolating or blowing up and driving everybody away in fear. And so those became the only tools that they had for setting boundaries. Neither of those are healthy, but those were all that they had. And then for many people with deep shame issues, 
where they feel that they're not lovable and they're not valuable. They're afraid to say no to people. They're afraid to set boundaries because they're afraid that the people won't like them then, that the people will be mad at them and they can't stand the thought of that happening. So there's a huge fear of saying no. And then they are set boundaries, but others can get them to change those boundaries. So they might say to their parents, we don't want you coming over this weekend because we've got a bunch of things planned. And then the parents will guilt trip them. After all we've done for you, we can't just show up and you don't appreciate us or the parents will get angry at them or the parents will do other little things to try to manipulate them to change the boundaries back to the way the parents want them. And the child is brought into those manipulation games and they give in over and over again. So they can set boundaries. They have great difficulty enforcing those boundaries. The third thing, issue is that they don't deal well with conflict. Just about everybody that comes out of complex trauma, conflict has never been a good thing. It has never resulted in growth or change for the good. Conflict has always led to more pain. It has always been a bad thing. And many of them, because of that, grow into adult life and they do not do conflict well. They are afraid of angry people and they are afraid of conflict. So they can go in a bunch of different directions. Most will be a fight or a flight variation. So the flight is to avoid conflict no matter what, at all costs. So that it basically is peace at any price. So if somebody is upset, give in to them. Say, it's all my fault, take the blame. And if another person's upset, go around, try to make them happy. Don't deal with the issue of what's making them up, upset. Just make the upset go away. And then avoid the, the real tough issues that might get them angry again, but they're the real cause of the problem, but you never deal with the real cause of the problem. So you try to avoid ever starting a conflict, but if a conflict does happen... Then you try to resolve it right away. Not in a healthy way, but just in a way to get it over and done with. And so basically it's kiss and make up. Don't talk about the problems. Let's just give each other a hug. Let's have sex, whatever, to make us feel better about each other. And then it's over and done with, but it is never dealt with. And so you avoid ever starting conflict. And if you're in a conflict, you avoid Resolving it in a healthy way, you just, just try to get out of it. Some take the, uh, the flight to another extreme, and that is, if you hurt me once, I'll never give you another chance. I will cut you out of my life. So I will never have to go through conflict with you because you're just going to get ghosted. And that is an extreme example that some have gone to. The other response that many have is the fight instinct. So you come at me with anger, I'll just trump your anger with even greater anger. And so what, they, what happens for many in com complex trauma is that when they saw conflict happen in their home, there was always a winner and a loser. And the loser always got punished or shamed or made fun of. And so their determination is, I will never lose an argument. I will never lose in a conflict. So I will break the rules. I will do dirty things. I will resort to whatever <clears throat> I need to resort to in order to win this conflict, even if it's violent, explosive, and anger. And some, anger becomes one of their greatest weapons to get what they want, to give them energy, to make them feel powerful, to even give them a rush. So they don't deal well with conflict. <clears throat> okay, let's move on. The next characteristic of people with complex trauma is they become super responsible, which is either they're perfectionists or super irresponsible. So what they're saying is if I'm perfect, then people will respect me. Then people will see me as valuable. Then people will see me as lovable and they'll want me in their life. Some go, why even bother? 
I'm not going to be able to be perfect, so why bother trying? So never try anything new. Never take on responsibility because you're going to fail anyways and disappoint people so they go to the other ex extreme to be very irresponsible. The next one. When a person in complex trauma is a child, they often will hate the person in authority in their life, dad or mom, and they might say, I'm never going to be like my dad. I hate what my dad is. And often as a child, basically they give up their rights and they act like the mature adult and they take care of dad's needs and dad's immaturity. And he's allowed to have temper tantrums and be a selfish little child. And they make all the allowances for that. And then they now move into being in authority themselves. And all of a sudden they go, I don't have to listen to anybody's rules. I don't have to put my needs aside. I can finally get what I want. And all of a sudden, they become this very selfish person themselves, and they end up becoming just like their dad. And so people from complex trauma hate people in authority, but when they get authority, they don't know how to handle it, and it ends up making them become like the very people that they hated. Next one, double standard in relationships. So you got that growing up with a double standard as far as boundaries. Now it's very easy to bring that into your relationships. And so you might say to your partner, I can go through your phone, but you can't go through my phone. I can go through your Facebook account, but you can't look at my Facebook account. And so all of a sudden, there they have no boundaries when it comes to checking up on you and, and investigating your life, but you're not allowed to do that at all. And so that double standard does a lot of damage because basically what it's saying is I'm superior to you. I can do stuff and I can live by a different set of rules than you can. And it sets up a relationship to fail. Next, they grow up with a very distorted view of love. It's sad to say that many people from complex trauma have never experienced genuine consistent love. Love that has no strings attached. What many of them experience is love with strings attached. Love is simply what you do as far as actions. You're really nice to a person to manipulate them, to get them to do what you want, to get them to give you something. So there's not unconditional love. There's love with conditions. For other people, love just means sex. So you love somebody, you have sex with them because you feel good. Or whenever you feel pity for a person, you feel such compassion and empathy, you go, those are such warm feelings, I must be in love. And then for many people with complex trauma, love is a feeling, an intense feeling of love, that oxytocin in the brain that says, I just feel all these warm feelings that must be love. And then, sadly, for some, love equal pain. Dad said to them, I'm beating you up and abusing you because I love you. And so for them, they if you love them, then you have the right to hurt them. They deserve to be hurt. That's part of what love is. And so love gets very twisted and distorted. And because they haven't experienced unconditional love, they're not even sure what they're looking for when it comes to genuine, true love. Next one. <clears throat> because of all the shame, there are tons of insecurities. So they don't feel they have value for who they are. So their value now is based on their body or their looks. But now they're insecure about their looks because that's what they're putting all their value in. Or their value is based on their ability to perform in sports on a job. And so now when they are on that job, they're insecure if somebody might be better than them. Somebody might show them up. So because their value is based on externals, they live with the insecurity all the time of, am I good enough? Will somebody surpass me? And that is a very tortuous place to live. Next thing. 
People from complex trauma usually promise more than they can deliver. So they're the first ones when you talk to them about a, a way of serving or a new idea for reaching out and helping people, they go, sign me up. And they're full of excitement and passion. And then later they don't deliver on it. They don't follow through and actually show up. And so they make lots of promises and then let people down. And that sadly has a lot of negative effects when they make those promises to their kids and then don't follow through on them. The next one is they don't have a healthy sense of what loyalty is or healthy loyalty. So they grew up in a family where they were told families stick together. We're blood. We're there for each other. We have each other's back. But what happened for many people is a couple different things that cause this loyalty thing to be confused. Number one is you never talk to others about your problems. You solve everything internally because we're loyal to the secrets of this family. That's not healthy loyalty. And then the next thing is they find that they're keeping secrets only about the bad stuff their family's doing. So loyalty means you never rat out your family. You enable them to do hurtful things and wrong things and, and take away all the consequences of that. And so loyalty is tolerating hurtful behavior, never requiring people to grow up and face consequences, and it gets very distorted. Whereas healthy loyalty is loyalty first and foremost to love and truth. That's my highest commitment. And if you're outside of that, I'm not going to enable you to stay there and clean up your mess and lie for you. No, because that's allowing something that's making you sicker and is making me sicker and is hurting our family. So to be loyal to a family in a healthy way, I first have to be loyal to love and to truth. So I hope what you begin to see is that whenever you're trying to help somebody by being loyal to them, even though they're doing self-destructive things and things to hurt others, you're actually being quite unloving. It feels like you're being loving because you're helping them out, you think, but you're enabling them to stay sick. You're enabling them to hurt others, affect you negatively. And so what feels like a loving action is actually a very unloving action. And that's very hard to face, but it becomes important because when a person <clears throat> is on a self-destructive pattern in life, they're not going to change until the pain gets greater than the reward. And as long as you keep taking away the consequences, which are the pain in their mind, why do I need to change? And so the more you're able to let them go and experience the consequences, the higher the probability that they're going to have enough change to force them to want to change. The next one that comes out of complex trauma is distorted thinking. What I find interesting is that a child growing up in a home of complex trauma is trained how to twist their brain and believe distortions. So if they go to dad and say, can I have a friend over? They're just asking for a need to be met of relationships, but dad says, quit being so selfish. And to the child, they just assume dad is right, so I must be selfish. And so they twist their brain trying to get it around the fact that I'm a selfish person. And, and they believe that. And so that sets them up to develop all kinds of distortions in their thinking that really hurt them down the road. So just a couple of them to give you an example. All or nothing thinking. Black or white. So it's a person that says, unless I am doing everything in recovery perfectly... I'm a total failure. I'm not doing recovery at all. And so one extreme or the other are the only options. They're not able to say, recovery, yes, I'm working at it, but I will stumble and fall once in a while, but I want to learn from that. No, that, that's too great. That's too undefined for them. It has to be I'm doing it perfectly or not at all. Or you might have a person who says, you're only my friend if you support me even when I'm doing bad stuff. If you don't support me when I'm doing bad stuff, then you're my enemy. 
There's no middle option. There's no other way of looking at it. The next one that is very common in the distortions is the person that begins to interpret certain events in their life and jump to the worst case scenario. So somebody doesn't talk to them that day or answer their text that day, and they go to, I guess, they don't like me anymore. Or somebody's not as happy around you as they might normally be, and you focus on that, and you go, I think they're getting ready to leave me. Maybe they're cheating on me. Maybe they're getting ready to abandon me or end the relationship. And you jump there and predict the future from that negative perspective. And then there's an element for many people of fantasy thinking or magical thinking. So they grew up in a home that was very dysfunctional, lots of hurt and pain, and they escaped through fantasy. And what was easy for them to do is to begin to think in their mind, if only this happened, we'd have the perfect family. If only this happened, everybody would like each other. And in the fantasy world, it seems like it's true. If we just could get this one thing everything would be perfect. Many come into recovery like that without even realizing it. They're still looking for that one thing that's going to make recovery easy and make their life perfect again. And that sets them up to be disappointed, disillusioned, and to say, what's the point? Next one. Growth for people in complex trauma Growth and change can often result in them wanting to undo that change and that growth. Let me explain it this way. We don't change unless there's enough pain in our life that we go, I can't keep living here. And then once we get to that place, we make a change and often we immediately see positive benefits. People are happier with us. People start to trust us. We get our job back. We get some debts paid off. We get our kids back. And we go, wow, that change was so good. But then, without even realizing, something else begins to happen. You now have entered into the unknown. You've never been to this place before. And that causes fear, but it also causes uncertainty. Because you don't know how to live here. You don't know what normal or healthy looks like. And so your mind starts going with, do I do this? Do I do that? And it's very confusing. And then you might even get people in your life who wanted you to change, who now come to you and say, we like the way you used to be. We don't like this new you. You're not playing the old rules in the family anymore. You're not as much fun anymore. And so you now get opposition. You get persecution. And that can be very confusing for you. And then you can also, as you begin to deal with something, then you realize, oh, now I got something else to deal with. So let's say that you've been struggling a lot with anger. And you start to deal with the anger and you see positive results. But then you see a lot of your anger comes from deep shame. And so you realize, oh, no, not only did I have to deal with anger, now I got to deal with shame. And then you start dealing with your shame and you realize, oh, my shame comes from the abandonment. So I got to deal now with my abandonment. And so the change would seem positive now just seems like it's going to be a whole lot more work. And that can be very confusing for people. And so there's all kinds of different things that happen when you start to change that feel negative. And you begin to go, maybe this change wasn't worth it. Maybe it makes more sense just to go back and be like I used to be. What they don't realize is if they just hang in there through the change and continue to do it, that they will begin to feel positive results consistently again. So there's this time after one begins to change that they begin to doubt that the change was the best decision in their life and there's something in them that wants to go back to the way things used to be. The final 60th characteristic, addiction. Addiction is basically the best solution to the problems of the life of a person with complex trauma. It's the best way to fight, flight, freeze. It's the best way to numb and avoid. It is, is also the way that creates positive feelings. You realize that the positive chemicals or chemicals in the brain that produce positive feelings. So you have dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, all of those good feeling chemicals 
Drugs can produce those same chemicals and make you feel love, make you feel good about your life, make you feel more confident, make you feel more in control. All of those things. And then there's relationship needs and the drugs seem to help that because now you feel more sociable. You feel like you fit in. You feel like you're accepted. And so drugs, alcohol, are seen by most people as com from complex trauma as the perfect solution to all their problems, to meeting their needs, to feeling good. What happens, though, is it seemed to be that way as a younger person, but now it is taking away all good feelings. It is not meeting needs at all, and it is making life worse and worse and worse. So it's a solution, it seems, but it only lasts for a little while. So I don't know how many of these 60 characteristics that you would check off as being true as part of your life. I don't know how many you would put down as still main big issues for you. But I do this not just to make you feel overwhelmed with, wow, am I ever messed up. I do it so you begin to see the patterns in your life, the ways you've developed to cope and relate to others. And then also the ways that you start to see yourself. All of those need to change. All of those are unhealthy. And so I don't just teach it so you sit there. I teach it so that you begin to realize I need to have a healthier way of relating to people. I need to figure out what I got to do to find safe people that I can trust, that I can open up to, where I can take my mask off. All of those things so that you can come out of this consequence of complex trauma Stuff that you did in order to survive, but that no longer works, that you can come out of that and learn a new way of living with healthy tools that leads to genuine happiness and joy in your life.